Well, good morning, everybody, um, and welcome to uh, this year's annual presentation um, about Asia, um, run by the Royal Society for Asian Affairs and the School of Oriental and African Studies. It's very nice to see you all here, some old friends and some new. So thank you for making the effort. I'm glad we weren't disrupted by the potential tube strikes. Um, and we can have a peaceful day away from certain elections. To introduce our first speaker, who is Jacob Dirksen, talking, as you can see, about who are the poor in Asia. <clears throat> That might look like an easy answer to you, but I suspect that's probably not the case. Um, Jacob's a research and policy officer at the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative. He researches multi-development poverty and supports governments and UN agencies around the world in measuring and reducing poverty. Jacob, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope it's a good morning, although rather distressing in light of the election results in the US, I think. Um, my name is Jacob, um, and yeah, I, I work in Oxford um, at a place called the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative. Um, what we do is mainly economics, uh, measuring poverty and related areas, but there's a lot of philosophy in it as well, thinking about what does poverty mean, um, and then how does it lead us to different answers about who poor people might be, um, and it also has a lot to do with public policy making because we work a lot with governments and UN agencies and support them in developing new tools that help them ideally better understand what poverty means in different contexts and how they can reduce the numbers that we, the usually rather sad numbers that we produce with them. <clears throat> My background also covers all these areas. So I'm trained as a philosopher, as an economist, and as a public policy scholar. So I found a very neat working environment for myself where I could put all these things, uh, I hope at least to some practical use. Um, I'm not going to give you a straightforward answer to this. I'm going to give you a few ways in which we might think about looking at poverty in, in various contexts and what that might mean um, and what the implications of that are. If at any point uh, you have questions, I might not be able to see you, but just frantically wave or shout at me. Um, and I'm very happy to be interrupted in case anything wasn't clear. Um, and yeah, otherwise there'll be time at the end for, for questions as well. Um, right. What I'm going to present is also... Oh, no, this is not showing on the big screen, I think. Let me switch screens. Sorry. So yeah, what I'm what I'm gonna present is not only my own work. So I just want to make that clear from the start. This is my big team uh, in Oxford and elsewhere. Uh, so many people who've worked on the stuff that I'm gonna present to you today. And what we already do is think quite carefully about how to construct statistics, you know, official statistics that countries might report about how the lives of uh, people in their uh, countries are going usually um, and the reason why we think quite carefully about how to measure things like well-being or inequalities or poverty is that often um, our governments then use these statistics and make evidence-based decisions that follow the advice that we might get from these numbers because of that it's quite important to be quite mindful and intentional about what do we put into these statistics and are we sure that the numbers that we're getting are delivering what we think we might want them to capture in terms of the conceptual content? Now, traditionally, uh, as I'm sure most of, oh, not all of you will know, um, poverty has meant looking at how much money people earn or spend. So we define something like a poverty line, you know, five pounds a day or something like that and then anyone who earns or spends less than that in a day might be considered poor they're below that poverty line okay, so we could go to a population like everyone here in the room and see how much money do you all earn whose pocket money falls below the the poverty line and then we could also produce some aggregate statistics from this that tell us how many people in this room for example would be classified as poor Usually this hasn't looked at pocket money, but rather at concepts like 
how much does a basket of food items in the country that we're studying cost or how much does a food basket and perhaps items of clothing or other basic needs that people should be able to fulfill cover. And then we count up those costs and consider everyone who isn't able to afford these things as poor. There's a huge effort to do all of this around the world by the World Bank, colleagues in Washington and elsewhere, who've over the years done a lot of work in trying to harmonize what these consumption basket um, contents might mean across different countries. And they've then come up with these international poverty lines that you might have heard of. At the moment, they consider anyone who has less than $2.15 in the currency equivalent in various countries um, as poor. And you can see here that looking at that figure, we see a very promising trend from the 1990s to where we are at the moment with the percentage of people who would be um, identified as poor uh, having drastically reduced and also the number going down from a staggering 2 billion or so to, well, still almost 700 million. We can also look at this across different world regions. And so you can see here, for example, that back in the 1990s, East Asia Pacific had a poverty rate based on these statistics that was around 65%. So about two thirds of the population in East Asia and Pacific was considered to be poor, so not having enough money to afford basic needs and, and food items. And you can see that since around 2015 or so, there's virtually no, no poverty there anymore. A lot of this has to do with what scholars have called the Chinese poverty miracle, reducing um, staggeringly fast the proportion of people there who don't have enough money to afford food and items and basic needs. We can also see that in South Asia, which was also in orange here, at around 50% in the 1990s, we've gone down to less than 10%. So also a very promising story here, um, which has a lot to do with um, the other subcontinent uh, in Asia, India, um, that's included here. We've also seen a lot of progress in terms of purchasing power that people have to, to meet their basic needs. Now, these are both regional averages, of course, and regional averages often hide many things. So we see these 700 million in the world, and we see certain percentages within world regions, but also we know what these figures look like at a country level. And so if we just look at a few South Asian countries here, for example, you can see that the percentage of the populations in each of these countries that are affected by not having <clears throat> sufficient monetary resources to afford basic necessities varies quite a lot. Still at around 13% in India and um, at less than 1% in Sri Lanka and Nepal, for example. All right, so it, it does help to not treat the whole continent or even um, different parts of a continent homogeneously, but to look quite closely at what's going on in these different countries. Okay, so that's one way of thinking about poverty and poverty in Asia, counting the number of people who don't have enough money to afford basic necessities. What me and my colleagues do quite a lot and what I'll try to convince you of in the next few minutes is that just looking at monetary resources might not be enough because if we think about what a good life means to us or also what an impoverished life means to us or what is important to us in our lives it's usually quite quickly and easily the case that we can agree on things other than having money in our pockets um, that we think of when we define what well-being or poverty means to us. And there have been many empirical studies where colleagues have gone to cities and villages um, around the world to ask people what they experience as disadvantages or deprivations. And money is important. So many people do report valuing money a lot and experiencing deprivations because of a lack of money. But they also mention many other things like poor health, lack of education, inadequate living standards, disempowerment, 
unemployment or poor quality of work, violence, hazardous environments, social and political exclusion. So many other things that we probably care about when we think of what it means for our life to go better or worse. And perhaps something that we also want our governments to take into consideration when they make sweeping generalizations and judgments about who in a population should be considered as better or worse off. Now, what you see here are a few indicators that we might think as being salient in addition to indicators of how many people are poor, for example, or how much monetary resources there are in a country. And what you see on the um, horizontal axis is each time the change in these non-monetary deprivation indicators, so things like child malnutrition, primary education completion rates, gender parity or under five mortality rates. And then on the vertical axis, you see the reduction in um, income poverty. Now, what we would expect if income poverty was very closely associated with all these other things that we care about is a perfect 45 degree angle and a straight line, right? So everything perfectly aligns on a straight line. The more income poverty I still have, the more child malnutrition, for example, I still have, and vice versa. But as we can see here, it's very difficult in most of these cases to draw a straight line. In particular, in the case of gender parity, we see almost the opposite, right? So we have a, a line that looks more like this, and we would expect something like this if both of these indicators moved hand in hand. So this is just some evidence that also shows us that it's not just conceptually, intuitively plausible to us to look at other things than income, but that also empirically, quite clearly, if we just look at income reduction, we overlook that many of these other things that we care about are not actually moving in the same direction. So we overlook quite a few things. Here's another very striking example. This is Bhutan, um, a small country in the Himalayas between China and, and India um, and Nepal there in the, in the mountains high up. And what we see here are the different districts in Bhutan. And for each of these, the percentage of people who are identified as being poor by income standards, so not having enough money to spend, those are the blue bars. And then we also see a different measure, which is a multidimensional poverty measure that integrates different indicators in addition to how much money people have to expand our view and provide a, a more nuanced lens of what people's lives look like. Now you might think there's a mistake here in the graph because as you can see the first district here that has almost 40% of people being multidimensionally poor, which means having many different non-monetary deprivations and there's no blue bar there. So no one's income poor. And the government also looked at these numbers uh, back when they had calculated these and were asking themselves, what's going on here? How come that the district that we thought was virtually having no poverty is the one that has the highest number of uh, people who are poor if we look at this alternative statistic? And so what happened here is that the people in this district, which is a remote rural district high up in the mountains, they earn quite a lot of money because they're, they are mostly farmers and they can export what they farm uh, for quite a lot of money because it's really rare um, agricultural produce that they have there. So they, they get a lot of revenue from that. And if you then ask them how much money they have, none of them would be below the poverty line that the government there set, for example. But child mortality is very prevalent. Access to education is very difficult because it's so remote. Electricity, often not found in the households. Drinking water, very difficult to access. Things like housing materials and all these other things. So things that people themselves don't necessarily purchase out of their own pockets, but the government provides as services, right? We don't expect a family that lives somewhere remote to build their own school or hospital or to build their own electricity grid and hire a company themselves to make sure that they have safe drinking water. And so the government previously had overlooked many of these issues because they thought, well, these people have enough money, so they're well enough off. 
And then they saw these results and did quite a lot of work in the subsequent years to make sure that these non-monetary deprivations in this district in particular, as well as in other districts where you can see there's um, a range of mismatches between who is income poor and who is poor by multidimensional standards. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about how we construct these measures and then also about the method that we use. And then I'm gonna show you a few things of what we can do with these measures by using a few countries in Asia as examples. So what we do is we take information from household surveys and it's just important to mention this because you know, it sounds like I'm saying all these people who've looked at monetary poverty have done a bad job. No, I mean, they've done a great job and it's still very important, of course, to look at how much money people have. The reason why me and my colleagues now also have started to look at all these other things is on the one hand, we actually now have the information to do so. And this wasn't readily available before. Some of you might have participated in some of these surveys yourselves or your parents might have or siblings, or other people in your households. You know, you sometimes just get a questionnaire and then someone sits at the at the table and maybe, you know, takes a few boxes. Or you have people coming, knocking on your door and asking you questions. Like in a census, these are done um, on a regular basis by all kinds of countries and institutions. And there's really been an explosion um, of these kind of surveys, which I'm going to show you in a second. And then on the other hand, now I can use my phone to calculate things for millions of people all around the world. Back in the days when they started doing these things, they needed a server as big as this room probably um, just to calculate things for one country. Okay, so two really important reasons why we're now able to actually do all this, this more fancy stuff is that we have the data, which wasn't there before, and we have all these super powerful chips that allow us to actually compute all these results. Here you can see an example, actually, let me show you this one on surveys that were done. And you can see it starts somewhere in the 1980s. We see a few surveys, these household surveys that we use with the data that is collected by knocking on people's doors and asking them all kinds of questions about, you know, things like how much money they earn, but also other things like how much education they had, their health status, they might even go and measure um, people's body mass index and other things. And you can see how, um, especially in the 90s and then the early 2000s, this really took off. And this is what has blessed me and all my colleagues who do all this work with the data to actually help governments try to measure poverty in a different way beyond just looking at how much money people have. Now, the way that we do this, I just want to also tell you a little bit about the method, is um, using the so-called Alkaya and Foster method. I'm terribly biased because these two are my senior colleagues, but also um, they have developed this method that now is used by various countries around the world and UN agencies to measure poverty in a multidimensional context. It's the method that we can flexibly apply to different countries or regions, and that allows us to take into consideration what is important there, so which deprivations or disadvantages we think of as being most important in a given context, for example. And it's also used as a method for the official Sustainable Development Goals Indicator 1.2. So goal one, um, many of you might know is reducing poverty. And then there's different indicators always associated with the sustainable development goals. And the second one is multidimensional poverty. The first one is monetary poverty. Um, and the methods that my, my colleagues have um, developed is the one that is being most widely used to report these official statistics and also the SCG indicator. A, a little bit of basic math, what do these indices, and I'm going to show you some of the results in a bit, so I just want to make sure that I've covered the preliminaries before then. What do these multidimensional poverty indices cover? Yeah. Two things. One, and that's what I've already shown you on the previous graphs, is what we call the incidence or the headcount ratio of people who are poor by whichever standard, okay? So we call that age or headcount ratio. That's the percentage of the population in each country that's that's poor, for example. And then there's a second ingredient that we use, 
and we call that the intensity. That means how many deprivations, non-monetary or monetary deprivations on average, are those people we identify as poor actually being affected by? So what's the deprivation load or the disadvantage load that poor people experience, if you want so? And then the basic mass is we multiply these two numbers, the headcount ratio and the intensity, and we get to what we call multidimensional poverty indices or MPIs. Why do we do this? You can ask yourselves, what's wrong with just looking at the percentage of people who are poor, as I've shown you on the previous graphs, for example? Well, imagine being a, a policymaker, and then you really want to sell to people that you've done something to reduce poverty. It has been one of your election promises, and then you know that you're going to be held accountable to whatever your poverty statistic tells you. If all you do to measure poverty is looking at the incidence or the headcount ratio, what's the only way to do something to change that statistic? It's lifting poverty by moving people from below the poverty line to above the poverty line. So to a policymaker who thinks, oh, I've got scarce resources, how do I improve this number so that people think I've fulfilled my election promise? The easiest way to do this is to put a lot of attention to those who are just below the poverty line, because you can easily move them out of poverty. But arguably, those who are at the very bottom are the ones who deserve much more attention. But doing something for those who are very poor and at the very bottom doesn't move people across the poverty line very easily. Okay, Because of that, we also look at the intensity, so that we can incentivize policymakers not just to focus on those who are just below the poverty line, but to also care about the, those who are considered poorest because they experience most of the deprivations that we incorporate into these measures. That's just because we don't trust politicians and we want to make sure that the numbers that we produce for them also incentivize doing something for those at the very bottom. Okay, why are these things useful? Well, on the one hand, we can also break down whatever we do with these indices and show not only overall numbers, but we can also show how much does a particular deprivation contribute to poverty. And I'm going to show you examples in a minute. And we can also disaggregate these results to make visible, for example, is here the left wing of the hall more poor, more deprived, or is it the right, or is it the center, those at the back, those at the front, um, for various groups or regions within the countries that we're studying, for example. And all of that makes it quite useful to then make targeted policies um, that develop specific solutions to hopefully reduce these um, depressing numbers that we produce together with the statisticians uh, in these countries. Some of the things that we use them for, well, I've already told you that, you know, monetary poverty, income poverty has been the predominant approach. What we now do is we complement these figures, like in the example from Bhutan I showed you. So we can show where the mismatches are and make visible that perhaps there's other people you might want to focus your attention on. We can look at these things over time, similar to what I showed you for the monetary poverty statistics around the world, to see how things are progressing, if people are actually making sufficient progress, or if there's groups that are being left behind and we might want to give further attention to. Then we can use that to budget across different government sectors or different population groups, target those with specific interventions so we see there's more need um evaluate our policies as we go along if something hasn't worked you know how can we tweak it um and also coordinate it if, across different sectors because I'll, as i'll show you in a second there's often many different sectors in government that are involved in delivering on reducing poverty here since it's about more than just money there's many different ministries you know education or health or infrastructure all these people get on board and can work together So for the rest of the presentation, what I'll show you is what is probably our most well-known product, um, which is the Global Multidimensional Poverty Index. Our latest report from this year was just released two weeks ago. Um, and what we do in this Global Multidimensional Poverty Index and the report and all associated numbers with it is we take data from these household surveys from over 100 countries. I think it's 112 this year, and over 6 billion people are covered by this all around the world. 
And we do this together with the United Nations Development Program in uh, New York um, to make visible the overlapping deprivations, so the multidimensional non-monetary deprivations that people experience across these three dimensions, health, education, and living standards, which also correspond to what is in the Human Development Index that I'm sure many of you will have heard of, which is an alternative to gross domestic product also uh, developed by the United Nations Development Program. We do these reports every year. Uh, and if you're interested, all of the data that I'm going to present here and many other things are online in tables and an interactive data bank. If you're interested in a particular country or a particular region, you can go online and um, study all these things uh, in much more detail. And it's a measure that helps us to compare poverty like the international poverty line across countries. And so we can compare multidimensional poverty across these three dimensions that we have across various countries in Asia, for example. And I'm going to show you how to do that in a second. But first, how does this measure work? So this is our answer of having something like an international monetary poverty line in the multidimensional setting, where we also care about many of these other things that I've spoken about a bit earlier. So we consider these three dimensions, health, education, and living standards. And then you can see we have a number of what we call indicators of deprivation within each of these dimensions. There's 10 of these indicators in total. And um, they consider for every household, if there's a person that's undernourished, usually children, but sometimes also adults, where we have evidence on you know, their weight and their height and their age, and we know that they're not sufficiently nourished. If a child has died in that household, in the last five years, if at least one adult has completed um, primary education or equivalent, if any school aged children are not attending school, and then six indicators under this dimension that we call living standards, for example, how many assets do people own and which ones, what are the housing materials, you know, the materials of the floor and the roof and the walls, is it rudimentary materials or um, improved materials, do they have access to electricity, to clean drinking water, do they have adequate sanitation, and also what kind of cooking fuel do they use, because many people all around the world, especially those who are more deprived, use things like dung or even mud, which means a lot of respiratory um, infection risks for those who are exposed to the, the fumes, and it's also usually an indication of them not being able to afford cleaner cooking fuels. You have an example here from Tamang, who lives in Nepal. Um, and this is Tamang and her family. This is the house that they live in. And what we do is we study the data that we have on Tamang's household and all other households in our data sets. And then we compare their living conditions to what we have identified as benchmarks in these 10 indicators I just showed you. Here, for example, Tamang's husband has a low body mass index, so would be considered undernourished. That's why we consider Tamang's household to have a problem in nutrition, and we would consider them as deprived. They are also, as you can see, living in a rather rudimentary hut with a dirt floor, for example. So we'd consider them also to be deprived in terms of the housing materials that they have. They don't have a toilet at all, so that would be another deprivation. And they use the neighbor's unprotected well for drinking water. An unprotected well is not a very safe source of drinking water, so we'd also count this as a deprivation for Tamang and her family. They do have electricity, so they wouldn't be deprived in, in this indicator, but they don't really own any of the basic assets that we usually consider, like phone, refrigerator, television, or radio. So we use this information, and then for each household, like Tamang's here, identify which of the indicators are they affected by irrespective of whether or not they have enough money, right? That's a separate question. We see that they have all these problems that are here highlighted in color now. If you count these together, because the indicators have uh, weights, so each of these dimensions is equally weighted, um, these indicators together amount to 44% of the weighted indicators that we consider. And our poverty line equivalent in the multidimensional sense here is that anyone who's deprived in more than one third is considered poor. So clearly 44.4% is greater than 33.3. So Tamang in a household, for example, would be 
considered as poor. We do what we've done for Tamangata family for all other people that we have information for in all the countries that we study. And then we can aggregate these numbers into our MPI, right? So as soon as I know how many people are poor, I can calculate the headcount ratio. And then I also know what's the intensity of their deprivations. For Tamangata family, it was 44.4. For other households, it might be different. So I can calculate the average of that again. And then I get to this average intensity of poverty that I was showing you earlier. Right, so that's the basic uh, mass behind this. Now, what do we get in terms of results if we do this? So remember that we have about 700 million being income poor by the global World Bank definition. If we apply the global multidimensional poverty index, we get that more than a billion, 1.1 billion this year, have at least the equivalent of one third of the weighted deprivations that we include here. Most have more. We also see that more than half of these people are children. Um, and that's something that also applies to um, Asia in particular. So if we answer the question or one of the answers to the question, who are the poor in Asia? Well, it's not just the income poor, but perhaps also the multidimensionally poor. And then it's really particularly uh, children who are affected by this and live in households that share many of these problems. You can see the distribution across the countries that we cover. Um, you can see that Asia is, compared to Sub-Saharan Africa in particular, doing a lot better. But we can also see some more orange and yellow spots like Afghanistan, Pakistan, Myanmar, and Laos. And then what we can also do is we can zoom in. I mentioned earlier that we can unpack poverty not only in terms of the headcount ratio, but also how these different deprivations that we included contribute to poverty. Here we, are, we have a global picture for all the world regions. And then in this case, it's Africa and um, a region in um, Burkina Faso. But we can do the same thing for countries in Asia, for example. Here you have a few South Asian countries. And all of these are subnational results for the global multidimensional poverty index. So you can see as a policymaker studying Afghanistan, for example, at the top left, or Pakistan at the bottom right, or Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, which regions in our country have a higher proportion of people who are affected by many of these non-monetary deprivations. We can also again compare directly the different poverty measures that we have. So if we ask ourselves, who are the poor in, in Laos, for example, we know that 23.1% have this critical mass of non-monetary deprivations, for example. If we look at, again, the World Bank's income statistic, we would have drastically underestimated this figure probably. Well, that's less than 10%, it's around 7% here. And then a few other monetary poverty statistics that get us somewhat closer or way above what we identified as non-monetary reprovations. Right, so the key takeaway here really is that there's different ways of looking at what does it mean to be poor, and these also give us different numbers in return. And they don't identify the same people necessarily as being deprived. If, again, I had just looked at the World Bank statistic here, I would have overlooked um, that almost a quarter of the population has this critical mass of deprivations that go beyond just looking at how much money they earn or spend. Another finding is that in almost all countries, I think in all countries, um, rural areas are much more deprived than urban areas. So we here have an example from Cambodia, where you can see on the right hand in particular, these bars add up to the value of the multidimensional poverty index. And you can see that the urban counterpart is much lower than the, than the rural one. And we can also again see uh, very nicely how the different indicators that we use to measure poverty here differ across urban and rural areas, for example. So we can also specifically look at how much does a certain indicator like years of schooling here, much more contributing to rural parts of Cambodia, for example, uh, compared to the urban ones. In Vietnam, we also see striking differences in what contributes to people being deprived across different regions, for example. You can see that in the Red River Delta here, for example, about 70% is because of child mortality. And then we can see in others, it's less than 10%. So we can really use this information to also give something to the policymakers if they ask us what can we do to bring these numbers down, then these are the indicators we recommend them to pay attention to. Um, 
Here the same in, in Suriname again. We can see again very striking differences by urban and rural areas. So the rural populations really seem to be left behind. Um, and again, children. So we see here across the region in South Asia, for example, we have a, around 120 million school aged children who are poor by the measure that we develop. And we know that around 37.5 million are out of school. And then you consider the overlap of these two populations to see that almost all children who are out of school really are also multidimensionally poor. That means that they also experience many other deprivations at the same time. There's differences in terms of gender for children being out of school with many more girls than boys in Afghanistan, for example, but also the rates being drastically different across countries here, right? You can see that in the Maldives, for example, there's virtually no children who are poor and out of school. And on average, still around 10% um, across the region. Okay, what I want to leave you with is, is it this bit here? So I've, I've told you about looking at poverty using something like an equivalent to the international poverty line. And I've shown you the global multidimensional poverty index and how that can be used across countries, including subnational regions in, in Asian countries. Now, what I haven't shown you, but what I'd invite all of you, if you're interested to take a look at um, later on, is that many of these countries that I've just covered also have their own multidimensional poverty indices. So if you're particularly interested in one of the countries, these are not only Asian countries, but also Asian countries, um, you can take a look at our website or the website of this multidimensional poverty peer network. All of these are countries that have developed their own statistics of looking beyond income poverty and looking at multidimensional poverty that integrate often more indicators than what we have in the global measure and produce different results that they compare to, for example, who is identified as poor in, um, for example, Sri Lanka, um, Pakistan, India, the Philippines, um, and so on. Um, and these countries are all using these to make policies to reduce poverty and to make sure that they don't overlook anyone by just looking at how much money they have in their bank accounts. I have many more slides if anyone's interested in additional countries, uh, but I think I'll leave it here and um, over to you for any questions. Thank you. Jacob, thank you very much for that. Um, there's no escaping maths and science wherever you go, um, but it does make one realise that uh, that there is more there are more to countries than simply just looking at the landscape and smiling people on holiday posters. When you provide a country with information, data, statistics, call it what you like, do you put any conditions on that? So in other words, if a country says to you, we want to know who's poor so we can adapt our policies accordingly, do you say to them, well, here's the data, but we want to know what you're going to do with it, or do you just trust them to do something with it and not falsify it? So <clears throat> we do very careful quality checks on all the data that we receive, um, because there's some risk um, that some countries try to artificially meddle with these numbers to make them look better um, in terms of having reduced poverty, for example. But a lot of the data that we work with is also already out in the public domain anyways. So anyone can go and manipulate these to create different statistics of poverty, for example. When we partner directly with governments to develop a new statistic, so that some of the services that we do as academics is we provide um, services to, to governments, for example, when they come and say, well, you know, we really see the value of doing something like this and developing a multidimensional poverty index. We see that other countries have gained a lot by, you know, making sure that they don't miss out on anyone because they just focus on money. What we usually do is we provide a lot of training on all of the mass and statistics behind this, but also on how to make sure that there's a legitimate political process that leads up to uh, these these numbers. And then we have to trust, of course, on the government uh, using all of these resources and the knowledge um, 
in line with their mandate in order to improve the lives of, of people in their country. Of course, once we've done these services, we don't have any control over that any longer. Um, <clears throat> so there has to be a <clears throat> relationship of, of trust um, and we do our due diligence in the, in the process. Yeah. Thank you. Now, if anybody's got a question, do wave a hand and there's a roving mic so you won't have to shout too much. There's one here in the front and one there in the back, I can see right. at least. Charlie, you can see <clears throat> who's got a hand up. Thank you. Hi. Good morning, Jacob. Um, with regards to um, dealing with governments that do try to meddle with the M measure poverty index and the global MPI and is there a a specific way do you, do you give like a specific sanctions to any governments that do that if it ever gets to a serious level or um do you just not do anything about it yeah, that's a good question. So, I mean, I can not really do a lot and my colleagues can't either to sanction any government because we don't really have any mechanisms for doing that. You know, we can't put any embargoes or or put sanctions. The thing that we do is we say, look, if we don't trust your numbers, we are not going to publish the results for your country if we think that you've manipulated those. And that might look bad enough for them because these are numbers that are officially released at the UN. Um, and so if a country is missing and we have to say this is because we didn't trust the numbers, of course, that wouldn't look very great. But so the, the only sanction really is bad publicity in that sense so that we can say we refuse to work with these data. Um, other than that, their governments, uh, their sovereign. And I, I, I and me and my colleagues, we don't have a lot of tools really to to try to um, bring them to betterment. Um, hi, uh, you know, for the MPI thing you're saying for all the countries and they have their own methods of like measuring poverty, how do you access it like online? So if you go to either of these websites, one is my research center in Oxford, uh, OFI, and then the other one is this multidimensional poverty peer network, which is a South-South network of countries. And we're the secretariat of this. So we also administer that website. But you can see if you then look for things like national measures or national MPIs rather than the global MPI, you'll see many different examples of how countries have developed their own alternative ways of measuring multidimensional poverty, including the different dimensions and indicators they've included and also the results that they've calculated with those. Yeah. Hi. Um, in terms of the three dimensions of poverty, um, some of the criteria, wouldn't it sort of be imposing westernized views on what classifies something as poverty on certain cultures that might not have those kind of views on it? For instance, having a lack of edu um, sp schooling and spe specifically and um, use the type of sanitation and cooking assets and such, that wouldn't be applicable to all cultures. So to say that that makes a specific culture poor, wouldn't that be imposing westernized cultures on um, westernized views on those cultures? Yeah, um, so that's a question that came up a lot uh, or still comes up a lot whenever we develop these kind of indices. Um, actually, not only for the for the global measures, but even within countries, especially in very diverse countries, there's always a question, are we imposing what counts as a deprivation for one group in a country, but maybe for another group in the country, uh, it doesn't really apply. Um, there are trade-offs, so usually it's something like the... Um, yeah, the, the compromise that these different groups make. So there's always a long process that leads up to making these decisions. In the case of the global measure, there was a huge review um, because this was done together with the UN. It's not necessarily a Western product, um, but an already international one. But of course, there's certain um, power structures also within the UN. Uh, most of these indicators were taken from, for example, other sustainable development goal indicators or millennium development goal indicators. Um, but yeah, it's always the case that some groups and some countries, both for the global measure and for the national measures, don't feel um, represented by one of the indicators, for example. The hope is that even if they disagree on one, they can hopefully still agree to the other nine or ten or so. You know, so, And if just one indicator is the one that they don't agree on, if they're just deprived in this one indicator, they wouldn't be poor. So they need to have a critical mass of deprivations anyways, right? So if for cultural reasons you want to live off the electricity grid, but 
in terms of all the other deprivations you're doing well enough, you wouldn't be identified as poor, right? So there's some way of accounting for these different cultural practices or even people's preferences, if you want so, because you need to really have a, a critical mass of these deprivations in order to count as, as poor. Um, but yeah, these statistics try to cover large populations. Um, I'm sure even all of us in this room wouldn't be able to agree on the one set of indicators uh, and we all live in the same country, right? Um, so it's even more difficult, of course, if you do this internationally. Um, it's not perfect, but it's hopefully better than um, just looking at um, how much money people have, for example. Um, but yeah, lots of work. I think we better talk, I think we better call it a day, if you don't mind, because if you want to have a break before uh, we move on to the to the language tasters. So there should be some refreshments outside, stretch your legs, and then <clears throat> um, Charles will gather up 60 people to go off to Mandarin, uh, to chai, to Arabic in about 10 minutes, and everybody else back here for Mandarin. Thanks. Yeah.